Maybe we could go and do introductions just in case other people show up and we know who we are. And then uh, Shana said she'd be 15 minutes late and it's almost 15 minutes. So if we hold out for that, maybe we could do some actual business. Otherwise, I'm just not sure when to call it. So um, I'm Cameron Niedermeyer. I'm the Assistant City Manager and Staff Support for this committee. I'm Nicola Anderson. I'm the Director of Real Estate Development for Downstreet Housing and Community Development. Could, could you speak up? Because it, it's hard to get it. I'm trying to take notes. So a little louder. Right. Nicola Anderson. I'm the Director of Real Estate Development for Downstreet Housing and Community Development. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm Carly Abrams. I uh, work at the Nature Conservancy, and I am very interested in this committee and what it's doing, and so I'm kind of sitting in as a first intro. And Montpelier resident. Um, I'm Michael Sherman, a member of the committee, and, 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 and the, uh, I guess, the forever note taker. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> uh, good morning. Lifetime conviction. Talking about jail rooms. <laughs> <Get at it. laughs> um, I'm Lauren Hurl. I am the city council representative on the committee. Um, have been on it for a couple of years. And nice to see some new faces today. Good for us. So does anybody want to tell me background on what you've done so far or like what sort of topics get talked about or? Yeah, for sure. Lauren, can I sort of call on you to give the history of that? Sure. I can do a quick and then others fill in. Um, so this committee was formed, what, probably like three years ago um, or so from city council, um, really wanting to have a venue to, to better look at how the city is addressing equity issues and, you know, a whole host of different types of people who live in our community and how we're, you know, making sure that city government is working for everyone and looking at the policies and budget and other things, um, you know, with an eye towards how we can improve um, equitable outcomes. And um, our biggest, most recent work, we hired a group, Creative Discourse, who are consultants to do an equity assessment of the city, which I can dig up in a second and put in the chat. Um, so there was a big um, public process, like a bunch of different, um, outreach techniques um so collecting a lot of community input uh and and then they brought forward you know a set of recommendations things that they'd heard directly from community members as well as their experience working with other communities and just doing you know equity work for other city governments and stuff so there's a set of recommendations that um we are you know, we're kind of at the point now of like, how are we taking action steps to move forward on a number of those recommendations? Um, we've also kind of, as that's been happening, we like last year, for example, which Cameron was just referencing, had um, developed a kind of budget tool of how are we considering equity implications of different um, budgetary decisions that we're making. And we've done been doing more in you know, some of our policy work and um, have done things like gathered the many different city committees, um, leaders to start conversations about that. So like our housing <laughs> folks and planning and, you know, all the different ways. And so starting to um, 
think about how we can work with different issues that are front and center and that came out of our equity assessment to, um, to you know, better coordinate and be doing this kind of work with uh, different groups that are intersecting with city government. What would you add, Michael Cameron? Uh, one, one correction, it was, we were started four years ago. Um, so it's a <laughs> minor, a minor detail. Time is an um, illusion. Time. Um, and uh, just, I think you covered it all, except, you know, in general, we agreed that the three things we were going to focus on was access, citizen access to government and government services, housing, and um, what, we all, what I guess racism generally, but I don't see any specific ones on that. But, um, and we, in our last meeting, we did look at, some possibilities of where where to go and people to talk to, and I'm glad to see that someone from Downstreet is here because you were high on the list. Um, and uh, let's see, I I'm not sure what else is going. Oh, we have we're we're very slowly, and that's my my fault. Working on up um, revising the city the city of Montpelier history page on the city website. I have a draft in hand of, from one part of it and waiting to hear from the state archaeologist on the, 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 uh, the, the history before uh, white settlement. So I'm not sure of a deadline on that, but we did get go ahead from Cameron that we could go ahead and do that. And, um, I will get to it probably in the next week, week or so, get back to that. Right. That's our, that's, I think our first um, one. Um, let me, let me take a minute to stare at my computer and I'll pull up the website page for this committee. And it has all of the um, links to the reports that have come out of this so far, which is um, pretty illuminating the work with um, uh, cre uh, creative discourse has been really instrumental in sort of planning some of our future work um, and sort of guiding what, what our next steps are because we definitely want to continue that work. And so as we enter into the budget conversations, just making sure that work keeps going. Oh, thank you, Lauren. She linked to it. That has our homepage for this committee and I try to keep it as updated as possible to link to uh, all of the things that we're working on. <laughs> all right, y'all. I don't know if how you feel. If, um, if you want to just give an overview, maybe of what Downstreet does, and then um, I so because work is here, so we can have that recorded. So mm -hmm. if anyone was interested in logging in for that, they could at least have that um, conversation. Um, there's no action or anything that we can do right now, but we are certainly able to just sit and chat about things. So does that sound okay to you, Michael and Lauren? Yeah, okay. so you, you, you would like me to take notes on Carly's presentation? Is, is that it for? It's Nicola's actually who's gonna be present. Oh, it's Jeremy, we did it. Oh, okay. Yay. Perfect. Amazing. So I think we should take advantage of the quorum here and approve your agenda and the minutes and then sort of turn it back over to Nicola to talk about Downstreet. Hi, Jeremy. We've been just hey. holding out for a quorum. So Sorry, I'm late. I had a kid transportation thing I had to deal with. <laughs> Life is still here. We mm -hmm. forget about it, but life's still here. So um, uh, I don't want to sort of take over your meeting, but I would be great if we could get motions to approve things. <laughs> I'll, appro I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. I Se second. All in favor? <laughs> 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 okay. Jeremy, Jeremy, why don't you take over the meeting? How's that? Until okay, she let me let me until, get myself, if and until let me get myself oriented here. Okay, it looks like we just approved the agenda. Congratulations. All right. Yes. 
There's Shana. Um, okay. I, I move we approve the minutes. Okay, I, um, I have to, I, I missed, I thought I was done with drafting minutes and then I just found the minutes for the, my notes for September 22nd. So I apologize. Um, once again, I thought I was up to date, but not quite. But I did, did do the August 18th and the September 1st, and which was the, the non-meeting minutes. And then the September 8th, those, those you should have had you know, done at some point, right? Okay. So we're, it's a motion to approve the minutes from the 1st and the 8th, is that correct? It, August 18, which I thought had been approved, but I guess it yeah. didn't. August 18, September 1st, September 8th. Okay, um, I will second that motion that Lauren motion that Lauren put forward. Put forward. Um, all those in favor of improving the minutes, say aye. 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 Okay, those minutes are approved. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All right. Now, all to you, and I'm going to get it really close to you so that everyone can hear you. Perfect. So hi, everyone. Just to introduce myself again, um, my name is Nicola Anderson. I'm the Director of Real Estate Development for Downstreet Housing and Community Development. Um, I mostly focus on multifamily development, um, but we are based, our office is in Barrie, but we cover um, Washington, Orange, and Lamoille County with all of our services. There is... Um, Another group does do the multifamily housing development in Lamoille County, but we provide some other services in that area. Um, it has been busy in general, but I would say really the last two years have been even busier. Um, we're really fortunate, I think, for the amount of money that has brought, been come into the state or has been allocated to the state for housing. But the, the need is so high. Um, you know, it's, uh, I really, I firmly believe that with COVID, I think more people started to understand how um, housing is associated with healthcare, but also that housing truly is a human need. Um, and, you know, as a state, our response was during COVID that we placed a lot of the homeless into hotels. Um, you know, everyone really deserved and needed a place where they could isolate and be safe. And I think that now, um, over the last few months, especially, months especially, sorry, um, we're really working. Um, to, we're really working to. Sorry, Sheena, you are echoing. I'm not sure if you're able to I'm mute. I'm not sure if you're able to mute. Bam. Um. So, sorry, Sheena, I may just mute you again. <laughs> <That's fine>. Sorry. <laughs> um, but we are, you know, we, we've been working with different partners and different agencies um, are in central Vermont to work with different solutions. Um, you know, whatever, there's a continuum of care meeting monthly where we're presenting what available and open units that we have for people that were able to house um, people in our portfolio. Over 30% of our rental portfolio is um, now housed by homeless, previously homeless individuals and families, um, which is pretty incredible. Um, I think that, and that has really raised over the last year and a half. Um, it's, Funny, like I think that there's so much money coming in. However, the sources, um, in order to create a project, like let's just say, or in Montpelier, we have the French Block project that opened in 2018, and then our Taylor Street Taylor Street Transit Center project that opened in 2019. They cost about 10 million dollars. That's the construction cost in those projects. But even though like this ARPA funding, our funding into the state, that is one source that's increasing, but we still have like five to 10 other sources 
that aren't quite increasing. So it still makes projects difficult, the budget difficult to manage. You know, there's only a certain amount of sources that you can get. So there's not like that we can do 20 projects in a year. However, we have been able to do some unique projects. Um, in Bradford, we, in a mobile home park, we put two, we had two vacant lots. We've, these, these lots have been, or three vacant lots, and these lots have been vacant for like three years. So we put zero energy modular homes in these lots this past year, and now renting these to homeless families. And we were, so we're able to be unique with some of these COVID relief funds that came into the state, able to, where we had vacant areas, we put in connections to water. And instead of usually a mobile home park, people own their own homes. They just rent this spot, the lot. However, we were creative and have made three rental plots there. We're partnering with the Good Samaritan Haven um, to um, at the Twin City Motel that in Berlin, that is going to become a permanent um, homeless shelter. And um, that's going to house up to 35 individuals. Um, so there's just been, it's been great because we've had the opportunity to do some unique and different types of projects. Um, we are moving forward with a project in Berlin as well, up at the Berlin Mall, Fox Run Apartments. We're going to be providing 30 new units. But that's not, you know, this is to be, to understand our timeline, we started applying for funding in 2019. Unfortunately, we're not going to secure our funding. And even this year, in such, when all this money's coming into the state, we weren't awarded our full ask. Mm. We're not going to secure that funding until May of 2022. So that is really three years it's taken to get fully funded on that project. But that will provide 30 new units. It's really exciting for Berlin to have. It's close to national life. It's close to Montpelier, but also housing opportunities near um, the hospital and different resources in Berlin. So there's, there's lots going on. I think that um, lots of conversations being had in Montpelier and all around our uh, service area of possible projects as well really trying to take advantage of people that are interested and have the space. But please ask questions too. <laughs> what, is, what does rent community. look like on one of these places? What rent? So rent, yeah. we, we build af we, affordable housing, but we do, some are market rate units. So they, rent's kind of determined by um, the area median income. So it's, you know, a one bedroom apartment is usually, it's, that, it's like between less than $900. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Like usually in, rents probably within like 800 to $900 for the affordable units. For the affordable units? Yeah. That doesn't sound that affordable. I think there's probably ones that are, it depends on their income. So it's hard. Like I can't, each, each unit is a different price. There's ones and units that are for people with 30, like if people are homeless or have no income and they can be tied to subsidies, they might pay 30% of their income. Or okay. so like if they have a section eight voucher. So, so it's, it's not, okay. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's hard to explain. It's different for it's each. Like a case by case basis. Case by case basis. So if someone has a section eight subsidy that or, or project-based vouchers, some of our projects have projects, project-based vouchers, they will cover the majority, they will cover the rent. However, the resident will be responsible to, responsible to pay 30% of their income. And that usually, that means their portion of the rent is like mm -hmm. 200 to $300 a month. Okay. That's much more reasonable. Yeah. Considering what I hear people can afford. Yeah. Um, so another question I had was, um, so you talked about building um, the homes in like the trailer park is it, like the vacancies are often, they, I mean, they're also, they're often in floodplains. So when we build places, do we make sure that they're, they're always in a safe, safe zone that they're not likely to be, 
you know, focal yeah. point for climate change. Um, yeah, if we ever build in a floodplain, we, we always build above the floodplain. So we, you know, we have to take the building out of the floodplain in order to build. Okay. Um, so there's, you know, like different projects. Yeah. So we'll raise the elevation and we'll do some mitigation efforts for that floodplain. Is this the right place? Where are you looking? Uh, for community restorative justice. No. No. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. I have two questions. Um, yeah. One, I was curious if you could just talk a little bit more about, um, like, it seems like there's this narrative of, you know, they have like set aside so much of the American Rescue Plan Act money and stuff for housing. Um, so it's interesting to hear you say, like, you didn't even get fully funded with your thing when it seems like, like, I guess it would just be helpful to hear a little bit more about like, what are the biggest barriers to being able to like ramp stuff up given that we do have unprecedented money. And then the other piece is like, what do you, what could, um, you know, as a group that's a city of Montpelier, like what could, what could the city be doing um, to be supporting these projects to move as quickly and, you know, effectively as possible? Are there things that we could be doing to help? support so that. really i think everybody's been hearing about um the arpa funds coming in how much money that is but there's restrictions on the funds as well so um one of the restrictions is the area that it can be used in which qualified census tract unfortunately montpelier doesn't count as one of those areas very for central vermont i think the only place is berry city the other issue is that you're only eligible for funding the other, so the other condition is that a homeless unit is, you can get money for that homeless unit. So that means when you, when we build that project, we have to guarantee that a homeless individual or family will live in that unit always. Like whenever there's turnover, we only rent it to a homeless individual or family. That's not, that's not the problem. Like that's not an issue, but it's also, you know, some of our other funders then value it's mixed income, mm -hmm. making sure that we are, you know, not just building a homeless only project or homeless only building, you know, integrating many different incomes into projects. So in a 30 unit building, it's how many homeless units can we actually get in that building. So that will provide, so thinking of it, and then also thinking of the homeless units, it's making sure that there is services attached to those units as well. So it's creating MOUs with service providers, which I think service providers totally understand and wanna help and be a part of these units. And we, we definitely have the interest there as well in regards to service. So I wouldn't say that's a challenge, but I think that we also know the workforce um, the challenges around the state and around the country regarding getting people staffing. So it's meeting the staffing needs for the, providing these services as well. Um, so it's, I think that all the, all these details make it a little bit challenge, challenging to just, it's not like we build a $10 million project. I can just say, Oh, we have this gap of $5 million. We're just going to use this $180 million that's come into the state. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. Could you say a little bit more about what the quality census tract means? Yeah, so there's, it's, um, there's a map online, and I can share that link out as well to Cameron, and maybe she can share that. Or I can take a look. I can, uh, yeah. So there's an area, a map of, and I, to be honest, I don't know the great details, but I think it's pot. I don't know how they, do you know how they calculated that? Um, I think it's like uh, uh, residents per area and yeah. income of those residents, basically. It's yeah. like how concentrated is wealth in your community, basically. Yeah. So I don't know if you heard that from Cameron, but it's like the concentrated wealth. So unfortunately, and it, I think that we're sitting here and you'd be like, why wouldn't this 
community qualify? Why wouldn't all of our communities qualify at this time? But that is one of the, right now, it's just very city has it. <laughs> and it only works for new units. So, which isn't... Does that mean, like, renovation, too, doesn't count? So, renovation doesn't count. Absolutely. Yeah. So, it's only brand new units, adding new units. Hmm. That's stupid. And I will say, construction's cost is fluctuating, but also in skyrocketed. So, that, you know... A, it's an extra million dollars at least to build a new building now. Yeah, I wanted to, I don't wanna lose Lauren's second question because I thought that was really important too. Like, what do you think the city of Montpelier could be doing to help support increasing access to housing? Yeah, thanks for that reminder, Jeremy. So it's, I will say like there's a little bit of there's so much interest and in people reaching out to us you know we have um people reaching out all the time so I think the challenge honestly in my end for real estate and like in my field in my end is that part of our projects are tax credits so these nine percent tax credits these board meetings come up once a year and that's that source of funding has not increased. Um, and these tax credits help pay and are based then, we are then base our projects off of the income eligibility. So it helps for a development of project, but then it's also part of the funding source for uh, their rental subsidies. So that, that source of income has not increased in the state. So this, this board meeting comes once a year and with the size of these projects, Really for central Vermont, we can get one, at most one 9% tax credit project awarded a year. However, that was the one funding source that we were not fully awarded this year. That's why that we still have a funding gap. So we were really, when we did um, French block in Montpelier, and then the next year we were awarded Taylor Street, mm -hmm. two years in a row and in one community, is uh, shocking. You know, that is very uncommon. So I'd say that's, that's part, that's a big um, hurdle for us to try and figure out that I'm really working through. So we, so then it's also being able to uh, use these tax credits are all of our other communities. You know, we're still trying to fund this Berlin project. And then another community like Waterbury, trying to do a 9% and a new development project there. So it's, and then what about Barry City? Do they, they need more development? So it's, it's this conundrum of actually eligible funding sources and the scale of project that we can do. Um, I, so I think that that's, the, the project opportunities are plentiful, but I think it's honestly still funding sources of how we can um, accrue some of these different funding sources so that maybe we're not relying so much on funding sources that are harder to come by. I mean, do you think there's an opportunity for, you know, lobbying? Are, are these coming from, this is mostly federal requirements or is the state putting strings on which could be changeable by the legislature like are there opportunities to be advocating for making the money flow more freely right now if there's like I mean it's so frustrating that there's like great projects that we just can't build when we have such an urgent need so is there I mean because part of you know I'm like there's the ARPA funds but there also was like an unprecedented budget surplus that should have fewer strings because that's not federal money that would have whatever yeah you know, red tape. So are there opportunities of like different pots of money that could be like shaking stuff loose and getting it moving? I think so. Like the tax credits are federal and that's really difficult. That's just how much are allocated to our state. I think ARPA funds have had, they've had federal restrictions put on them. And that's what's at first we were so excited when we heard about this money coming in, we were like, oh my goodness, the possibilities and everyone got so excited. And then when we learn more and more about the restrictions, 
it became so much more difficult. Um, the other part is just that it, it takes like a year to two years to do the pre-development and fund a project. It's not a quick project, a quick thing either. It's, you know, it's hard to get engineers right now to even get engineers to do the work. We're in such a shortage. They're so busy. So thinking about engineers to go out, we have to go through environmental review processes. There's, um, I think the shortage of people and time also is a challenge. You know, it's, I have six pro So for instance, I have six projects I'm working on right now. It's normal for a project manager to have like two and a half. Hmm. So we are working so hard um, and have lots of projects, but it's just never enough either. You know, I think that's part of the challenge. But if I, as opposed to technically with my workload, have like two projects, but I have six, that's triple the amount. So think of like what those engineers and architects are doing as well. And at some point it's, they can't get information as quickly as they normally could either because they're so backlogged. Um, but for the funding, I think there's, you know, I think the funders truly are on our side. You know, they, they're advocating and understand as well, but it's, um, it's the restrictions are on the funding sources, but we've got these funding sources, but the challenge is the other funders are not getting more income. So it's managing and like VHCB with its ARPA funds, every board meeting, they're handing out 30 million to five to 50 million. You know, it's not like they're not handing out the money. You know, there's statewide, it is being handed out very quickly. And a lot of it. And that's, to be honest, like with projects in Montpelier, my big thing is I've just done two, like we, with, with, with the Taylor Street and with French Block, you know, that brought 48 new units to Montpelier. But then I, when was the last time I brought new units to Waterbury? Mm -hmm. When's the last time I brought new units to Barry City? When's the last time I brought new units to these other places? And there's a need, serious need everywhere. So I have to be able to bring, and that's what the funders are going to say too, was that your, la your last new development where I'm on Pelier, we got to serve the whole service area. So that, that's another challenge. Who else is doing this? Like who else are the big players doing this work? So we, we are the players for Central Vermont. That's just it? That's just it. With this, this local nonprofit agency, there's each kind of like Champlain Housing Trust covers Franklin County and Chittenden County. There's Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust that covers those counties. So it just like we are the agency for this area. Michael, you your hand about, up. Um, I was wondering about maintenance and repairs and upgrading. Where's the money for that come from? And is it is it included in what's given to you or not? Or do you have to raise that separately? Yeah, so that's part of our operating budget. So when we're creating these, um, when we're creating our projects and then figuring out rent, that is part of our operating budget. So whenever there's a turnover, so if someone leaves and someone comes in, we will go in and make any repairs needed, replace floor, do those types of things. We have a 24-hour maintenance staff, so they respond to residents' needs. Um, I think that they're... So there's, we have a full-time staff um, for maintenance for all, of our, for all of our units. And, you know, the, and the service people that you were talking about, they, they don't need to be residents, right? They're, they're just, it's just, it's the work that they do in the daytime work, right? Yeah, so it's like services, so like providing services to some of these homeless units. So that's like using an agency like Washington County Mental Health or Capstone or the family center. Those are the types of agencies that, would, that, um, that we have different MOUs with that help provide services to our residents. Thanks. Yeah. And there is, you know, I think there's been great programs that have also been created by the state. There's um, VHIP, which is for landlords, so private landlords, that own units that are 
they have they have units that are vacant, but they need a lot of work to put money into them. They can apply to up to thirty thousand dollars to rehab their units or to like to put a new boiler in, to put in a new heating system. To maybe they just need new appliances or there was serious water damage. They can apply to up to thirty thousand dollars to rehab this work and then place um, a resident in their unit. And there's just there there are restrictions of placing low income residents in their units. So that is something that also came out of the state last year that is, I think has been a, such an important program. And that's a unique way too, that I think that we are putting um, this money into the state into great use. Instead of just worrying about some of these larger scale units, let's get units that are built on the market again. Yeah, that kind of, that's right where I was starting to wonder was the next question. And I don't know if this is your area of expertise, but what does Montpelier as a community have more control or impact in kind of getting more existing units, kind of housing ready for the folks that need it most? So clearly this, you said it's called VHIP? VHIP, yeah. yeah. So there's going to be more funding coming available. So we've kind of spent all the money from when it was um, active earlier in the year. And so um, this program, we've not gotten the direction yet that we're ready to go and the funding has been secured and conditions are met, but it's looking very positive. But I think that like that's information that I think, um, you know, it's letting, publicizing that. Mm-hmm. You know, if Montpelier can put that out there, like let them know that this is, this program is available to our landlords. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's something that we can do better to support. Hi there. Um, and maybe that's something that we can do better with our communities with Montpelier. Of, um, how can Montpelier promote that? Yeah, that's where I'm, my head's kind of circling around as, as this committee, CJAC, what can we do? could we play a role in that kind of communication, publicization, promotion piece of like, hey, local folks who own properties who want to kind of make a commitment to helping with the housing crisis. Yeah. Like rally folks in some way, get them information, organize people. I don't know. Um, That just, it seems more where we could have some impact. I don't know what others think about that. Yeah, I think that's, I think, I personally think that's a great idea. Silence. Yeah, I have a question for Cameron. Could the, the, does the city actually know who are the landlords? I mean, who, who have um, properties that are multifamily and rental? Up? Is that a way, can the can city help identify those people or is it just a matter of putting the word out and seeing who responds? Um, Michael, I missed the context of that question because I was out of the room. So oh, okay, I'm sorry about that. So I heard your question. I don't quite know if we track those things. So I'll have to find out and I'll let you know. But what was the context? The context was Nicola was talking about um, money uh, called VHIP money, which goes to private owners to uh, incentivize and uh, support renovation and and uh, fixing up places for multifamily use for homeless. Jeremy said, what can CJAC do, ask, what can CJAC do to help get the word out? Um, and so that my question is, well, does the city have a list so that we would know uh, how to reach these people directly rather than just sort of putting a, putting a word in like a newspaper or something like that. Well, that's fair. I'll, I'll follow up with Nicola and come back with, to y'all at your next meeting with information mm-hmm. about that. Thanks. Okay, thanks. I mean, the other thing about that, Michael, is it's not just, it may not just be a matter of kind of broadcasting, blasting information out, but it may be a matter of also kind of organizing forums or conversations. Because I, I can imagine, you know, there's a lot of, there is stigma around, you know, 
you know, homeless or low income folks and housing. And um, it may be a matter too of kind of understanding, you know, the issues in more depth of um, why the need is so important, why as a community it behooves us to kind of engage in these kinds of programs to help with the housing crisis. So um, just kind of riffing off some ideas here, but it, it may be that there's important conversations in the community that need to happen to bring landlords more into the fold. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think actually there's also stigma about rental units, period. Yeah, totally. I was on the, the development review board and one issue came to us about um, a housing, uh, a rental a rental unit that was proposed in, my, in up, up here on the College Hill area. And the, the residents in the area, to my surprise and disappointment, said, oh, mm-hmm. but they're just renters. We don't want them in the neighborhood. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and I, I think... That's something that really needs attention. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, great point. Yeah, that's that's really close-minded and elitist. Mm-hmm. You know, and forgetful that at one time most of those people were renters themselves, but <laughs> that's another story. But, um, but it also makes it difficult then to sort of org- you know to create communities into which these. Um, you know these these units and these people will will be able to fit, and, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and that's a serious barrier. Has anyone looked at the barriers to? I think I mentioned this last time um, when when my wife Nancy was on the city council. She um, was involved in a program in a in a committee study of barriers to housing, uh, and I don't know if that's come off the shelf and uh, has, into anybody's attention. Hi. Um, so yes, that has come up. Um, the council has mentioned it a few times, and so is staff. And their more housing strategic planning is is redoing that study, the barriers to housing study through the housing task force. So that has come up as a potential initiative. Um, yeah. Um, does anyone have any more questions for Nicola? I'll just say I think that uh, Down Street has done terrific work in the city, and we really should be very, very grateful for them. Um, they've really sort of, you know, in, increased housing stock and kept it in good shape. And I and I congratulate you as an organization on what you've done. Good luck going forward. Thank you. And seriously, Phil, I'm more than happy to ever come back and join in, but also any suggestions that you have for us in our work, um, I'd love to hear them. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I'll follow up with you regarding the, what was it, VH, what IP? VHIP program. Okay. That's like the rental rehab program. Okay. I'll follow up with you on that. Great. So um, y'all are coming to the end of your time. So I just want to make sure that we're good for the 20th for your next meeting. Is that what was on everyone's schedule? Any issues? October October 20th. Yes, sir. Um, Is there time for a very quick report on uh, a follow-up question that Palin had about language or do we have to get off? Do we have to get off? Um, so I, I made contact with Amanda Haas uh, at uh, Central Vermont Adult Basic Education, who runs their uh, English for non for non 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 native speakers, um, and she reported. Uh, Pellin asked, "What are the what are the major languages we should be targeting in our in anything that we do?" And the answer is uh, Spanish. Um, and then there are. Um, I have a long email that I can I'll send to Shana to that she can circulate to. Um, to the rest of us about all the all the all the different languages that are represented in their in the service that, that they're currently providing. But if we're going to if we're going to um, do anything, it's Spanish and then followed by Thai and Korean. So that's the answer to that question. It's different that's than true. what the school said, so that's a little wild. Oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, you have a member of the public, Stephen Whitaker, is here. He would like to make some comments. Jeremy, you're right. 
I'm sorry, say that again? Yeah, we're just making sure that you are okay with public comment now. Um, I think we have just a couple of minutes, so if, if Stephen could just limit his comments to maybe two or three minutes, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, I, I want to implore upon y'all to be, be more engaged. The Homelessness Task Force has not accomplished anything in its two years of existence, and we're approaching a, an emergency winter situation. And at the meeting later this morning, they're proposing to spend 70 grand, only seven of which is for actually putting shelter over anybody's head at Econo Lodge rooms. Uh, this is a human rights issue. This is a public safety issue. And it, it, this is the core of social and economic justice. So when we can't get city to keep the bathrooms open at city hall or to even enforce the lease terms at the transit center, which require those bathrooms be open from eight to six every day, we've got real social and economic justice issues here. We, we are kicking these people around as if they were, you know, trash and they feel like it and then they become acting like it and it creates a, a real problem in the community. So y'all need to be much more engaged on the, not just the abstraction of maybe some more apartments next summer or fall or the following spring. You need to be involved now in how are we going to create some dignified shelter for these folks this winter and bathrooms immediately. Um, in effect, City Hall is working against us on this. So I, I just want to, and also the open meeting requirement of, you know, a physical location necessitates uh, act, ability to hear, which one laptop does not provide, and ability to see who's talking. So we need to set rules on what constitutes the physical location, and it needs to be plugged into the, a big screen and mics and speakers such that everybody can hear. Uh, I know you'll see hear staff say, oh, no, everything's fine. Y'all are doing fine. But I'm saying you're, you're violating open meeting law. Thanks. Okay, thanks for your comments. And duly noted. Um, we are at time. Um, maybe just check in really quickly about agenda on the 20th. Um, there's still the lingering issue of... Um, giving feedback on the council strategic plan. Um, Lauren, do we have time to get into that on the 20th? Are we up against a time deadline? So there's going to be um, like next week, October 13th is our next meeting where we're going to be talking like initiative priorities, which is basically what are, you know, continuing our work. I mean, my, my sense is like, regardless of if it's like a top few, like we're, the council is committed, as far as I can tell, to like continuing to fund the next phase of the work and like either way, it's going to be happening. So to some degree, I think, you know, if people already voted, so I don't even know that like any outreach to counselors or anything is necessarily necessary at this point, but um you know, I think it'll just be, it's more like the budget's going to be where push comes to shove of like, are we funding the next phase and are we investing in things like the um, stipends or things like that? Like, that's where I think the real, and Cameron, if that doesn't feel right to you, chime in. But I, I think that's where like the next real action mm -hmm. steps of like, are we following through on the, um, you know, things identified in our equity assessment? And like, it's mostly a funding issue, I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, I could use certainly some, mm -hmm. I don't mind, and I would, I would appreciate uh, people looking, like committees looking at the strategic plan. Um, so we'll hopefully have um, a draft by your next meeting of work plans. And so looking at those initiatives and um, just, just the overlooking it would be helpful mm -hmm. to me, but it's certainly not something we have to do if okay. you don't want to. So yeah, I'll put I mean, it on there as a potential item to discuss mm -hmm. and we can if you want to. Yeah, that's, I think it'd be great to just thinking a little bit, <clears throat> yeah, basically like an item that is, you know, continue working on the equity. There's something big like that, but the, but also there's like several specific things of 
um, you know, improving language access and other things that are like teased out that are actually recommendations that came from the equity assessment mm -hmm. or some of the steps of work that we're doing. So um, I think, I think it'd be great for us to look and see how is that conveyed? Are those like kind of, um, you know, worded in the way that they should? And is it really highlighting some of the key action steps that we have identified um, in addition to the piece around just like broadly committing to continuing the work? So yeah. now, now that I, yeah. Okay. Well then let's, let's put that on our agenda for next time. If it seems like um, that makes sense. Um, and I see in what we have on this agenda, there's a couple of items um, that are kind of on the back burner too. And I think there's more to discuss on what we're hearing from folks around the housing issues that we've been discussing over the past couple of meetings. So um, I think there's more to discuss on that as well. And that's probably a pretty full agenda again. Um, so that takes us to a little over 930. Um, anyone have anything else on the committee before we break? Not seeing, okay. Um, all right, well, sorry I was late. Apologies for that. Um, and thanks for the great discussion and we'll, we'll get back together next time. Thanks everyone. Nice okay. to see Thank you. you. Bye. Bye all. Thank you.